prophecies. Uh, these are not cheap psychic predictions. These are world-shaping, history-making, world-shaking events that have in fact made the history of this world, that the whole world has witnessed their fulfillment, and they were prophesied uh, centuries, some of them thousands of years before they happened, and you just can't explain it away. Anybody who's a, a skeptic about this, all they have to do is look to the prophecies dealing with the coming of the Messiah, the first coming, and it lays it all out specifically, where he was going to be born, how he was going to die, uh, just things that no individual, no human being could make up. Well, if all the prophecies of the first coming of Christ have all been fulfilled to the letter, then we could say with a great confidence that the other prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. Researchers all over the world put faith in the prophecies of the Bible. Yet there are many who look to outside sources for prophetic insight and information about the end times. Where do unbiblical prophets and their prophecies stand in the Word of God? Isaiah 8:20 mocks them. Why do you turn to spirits that peep and mutter, these wizards? Perhaps the most famous is the 16th century astrologer, Nostradamus, and in modern times, the so-called Christian psychic, Edgar Cayce. The prophecies, so-called, of Nostradamus are not straightforward by any means. The Bible lays it out. It names names. <laughs> it names places. You've got to figure them out from Nostradamus. Uh, it's rather obscure and rather ambiguous. Nostradamus is often credited with having predicted the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte. The argument comes from this mysterious quatrain. In the third month, the sun rising, the boar and the leopard meet on the battlefield. The fatigued leopard looks up to heaven and sees an eagle playing with the sun. John Hogue, a best-selling author of Nostradamus prophecies, offers this interpretation. He writes, the third month, June 1815, the boar, this is Napoleon, and the leopard, what Napoleon called the heraldic lion symbolizing England. Normally, the third month would be March, but somehow Hogue has changed it to June to make it fit. He calls the boar Napoleon, though Napoleon's standard was that of an eagle, not a boar. Then, without explanation, he makes the leopard into a lion so it can symbolize England. In another quatrain, Hogue rightly identifies the eagle with Napoleon. But the eagle has also been a symbol for other nations, including Poland, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Hitler's Nazi Germany, and the United States of America. Why Napoleon should be singled out is not explained. Uh, different people come up with different ideas of what does this prophecy of Nostradamus mean, or what does that one mean. And uh, very often they have come up with prophecies, I mean, they thought uh, that didn't turn out. Or then after the fact, they, they think they uh, have found something. You know. For years, people have insisted that Nostradamus predicted Adolf Hitler with his quatrain. Beasts, wild with hunger, will cross the rivers. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hister. Did Nostradamus miss the name Hitler by one or two letters? as many suggest. Pro-Nostradamus author Erica Cheatham admits that commentators before 1930 understood the Hister to be the river Danube from its Latin name Ister. As with Napoleon, Nostradamus adherents must alter what he actually wrote to make it fit. This same author goes on to say that I can dismiss 95% of Nostradamus' predictions as historical coincidence. I wouldn't waste my time on the prophecies of Nostradamus for a number of reasons. Number one, he doesn't even know God. He's not a true prophet of God. Uh, God does not speak for him. In the Bible, this is a claim they make. More than 50 times Ezekiel, for example, says 
the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. They are laying it out. They are telling you very clearly that God is speaking through them. Nostradamus doesn't say that. In contrast to biblical prophets, Nostradamus used a form of divination known among witches as scrying. An encyclopedia on witchcraft today defines scrying as concentrating on an object until visions appear. It goes on to say that scrying has been practiced by magicians and witches through the ages. Among the purposes of scrying are predictions of the future. The object on which to concentrate is usually a shiny smooth surface such as the crystal ball used by gypsy fortune tellers. Ink, blood and other dark liquids were used by the Egyptians. Bowls of water were used by Nostradamus. In Deuteronomy God says, There shall not be found among you anyone who uses divination or who practices witchcraft or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. Nostradamus, by his own admission, seemed to know that his practices were condemned. The Nostradamus Encyclopedia says, quote, he, Nostradamus, indicates how it is possible for the diviner to open the mind to divine inspiration. Almost in the same breath, however, he beseeches his infant son never to dabble in such practices, for, he says, they desecrate the body, disturb the mind, and send the soul to perdition. Edgar Casey believed, came to believe, well, he was a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher at one point. Uh, he got into this through hypnosis. Uh, he had a throat ailment and was healed of it by a hypnotist. And then he began to put himself under self-hypnosis. And then he began to get these uh, visions in that state. He was in an altered state of consciousness. Uh, and he got his information, he said, from the information. That was what he called it, the information. This was not God telling him this. Uh, well, he would put his hand over the third eye uh, and go into this trance, and they would bring uh, names and, of people and addresses and so forth, and he would say, yes, I see the body. And now he could even describe this person miles away. So that was very impressive. But one day when he came out, of his trance, they told him that he had been talking about someone who had been reincarnated. Uh, well, he hadn't believed in reincarnation. In fact, it's not biblical. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. But he abandoned what the Bible said because this information that he was getting in this altered state said reincarnation was a true event, okay? Casey would go on to teach the reincarnation of biblical characters, including Jesus himself. He taught that Jesus was the reincarnation of Joshua in Shiloh, Joseph in the court of Pharaoh, Melchizedek as he blessed Abraham, Enoch as he warned the people, and Adam as he listened to Eve. Casey taught that Christ is not a man, though the Bible says that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus and warns that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Bo Casey author John Van Auken tells us that obviously Casey's perspective on Jesus Christ is much different from the churches. When he set aside his outer self and lifted his deeper mind into the universal consciousness, a new perspective on Jesus Christ came through him to us. The Apostle Paul warned, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, you might well bear with him. There are, I think, seven marks of a false prophet in the Bible. Deuteronomy 13, you have the first one. Uh, it says if a 
if a prophet or a dreamer 